bring in Michael Klein, Professor of International Economic Affairs at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He joins us live from outside Boston. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Rochelle. Good to be here. So what do you see as the key parallels and differences between the U.S.-Japan trade war and the current trade tensions that we're seeing between the U.S. and China? I think there are more differences than similarities in many ways. If you think about what was happening at the beginning of the 1980s, the U.S. was about to enter the deepest recession it had suffered since the 1930s. And also, because of the strong appreciation of the dollar, the manufacturing sector in the United States really got hard hit. That's when the term Rust Belt emerged. So in those ways, it's quite different because right now, we're at record low unemployment rates. And while manufacturing has been going down in the United States, it's been going down in other advanced countries as well. Unlike the early 1980s, it wasn't so special for the United States. So the context is really quite different. And also, finally, the geopolitical context is different. The United States and Japan had more common geopolitical interests at that time, where the United States was providing military uh, protection for Japan. And China and the United States don't have that kind of geopolitical relationship. Now let's look at the strategies that both countries used as trade tensions escalated. How do they stack up then compared to the sort of tactics that we're seeing between the U.S. and China in their current trade standoff? In the 1980s, the United States imposed voluntary export restraints on Japanese autos, which is actually sort of like a gift to them because it makes them more like a monopolist. And the Japanese auto industry also got around that by importing higher quality cars. So if you're limiting the numerical number of cars, then if you import higher quality, you can maintain profit margins. Finally, there's also a situation now where international supply chains are more important. We have an estimate in an Econofact piece that there are something like 80 jobs in the United States that use steel for every single job that makes steel. So the United States is going to be hurt when the price of steel rises because all those steel using jobs are going to be adversely affected by the higher price of steel. And, and to your point, a lot certainly has changed in terms of the global trade and supply chain since the 1980s. So talk about the role of these intermediate goods, and especially in this current globalized economy, and the sort of fallout that could now happen from a trade spat when you have the, two, the world's two largest economies involved. Well, one important thing to note about the international supply chains, Rochelle, is that it really muddies up the water when you're trying to understand what are the bilateral trade relationships between two countries. So the iPhone is a good example here. Every time the United States imports an iPhone, it looks like a $225 import from China. In fact, estimates are that only about $5 worth of that iPhone is actually value added by China. The rest is coming from other countries that supply intermediate inputs to that, and even from the United States itself with its research and development. So that's actually quite different than the situation in the 1980s when the supply chains weren't nearly as pervasive. And let's also look at the broader picture. Back then, Japan's export to the U.S. in 1985 accounted for about 37 percent of its total exports. Meanwhile, China's exports to the U.S. in 2016 were only 18 percent. So given the much smaller share of Chinese exports involved, how likely are we to see concessions rather than seeing this escalate into a trade war? Well, it's not just the total amount. The Chinese tariffs that are, they're putting in place are very specifically targeted. For example, soybeans or Harley-Davidson's, which come from Wisconsin, or Kentucky bourbon. So you can make the connection with the kinds of politicians that are going to be hearing from their constituents about this. So when we look at the overall picture, it ignores the fact that these are really political decisions. And particularly strong political actors will have a motivation to respond to this. And very quickly, if there was one main lesson you think that we could learn from what happened with the U.S. and Japan and seeing how it could apply in China's case, what would be the biggest takeaway? I think the biggest issue is that bilateral trade deficits really aren't that important. The overall trade deficit of a country has to do with how much it saves and how much it invests. And part of the saving is savings by governments. 
So the tax bill that was just uh, passed, where there's going to be a $1.5 trillion increase in the U US government debt, means that the government is going to have to borrow more from abroad. And that necessarily means that the trade deficit is going to get bigger. So in a way, these bilateral deficits, Rochelle, are a bit of a sideshow, a bit of political theater. And the real issues, the core issues, issues of jobs at good pay, issues of inequality, these are things that these kinds of bilateral trade issues won't really fully and adequately address. Well, thank you so much for your insights, Professor Michael